Jamaica's journey to independence. Jamaica remains a constitutional monarchy with King Charles III as the head of state, represented by a governor general on the island. Some see this continuation of the British monarch as head of state as a lingering colonial tie. The presence of a governor general, appointed by the monarch on the advice of the Jamaican prime minister, is viewed by some as a symbol of continued British influence. Economic challenges have persisted since independence. Despite initial growth in the first decade, Jamaica has faced uncertain economic conditions, particularly from the 1970s onwards. August 6, 1962, a date that forever changed the course of Jamaican history. On this day, Jamaica officially severed its ties with British rule, stepping into the world as an independent nation. Today, that momentous occasion is celebrated every year as Independence Day, a powerful reminder of the island's long and difficult struggle for freedom. But to understand what independence truly means for Jamaica, we have to look back, far back, to the island's earliest days as a colony. Our story begins in 1509, when Spanish explorers first claimed Jamaica, the Spanish had one goal, to conquer and control. Their brutal tactics nearly erased the indigenous Taino people, who had lived on the island for generations. The Spanish weren't just after land, they were after domination. They forced the Taino people into labor, trying to wipe out their culture, their language, and their very existence. Within a few decades, the Taino population was decimated, but the story doesn't end there. In 1655, the British stormed in, taking Jamaica from the Spanish and adding it to their growing empire. With the British takeover, a new chapter of exploitation began. The island became a crucial part of the transatlantic slave trade, with thousands of Africans brought to its shores in chains. But amidst the oppression, seeds of resistance were already being sown. Some of the enslaved, along with surviving Tainos, managed to escape into the mountains where they formed independent communities. These communities became known as the Maroons. The Maroons were not just survivors, they were warriors. For decades, they waged a guerrilla war against the British, defending their freedom at all costs. The First Maroon War, from 1728 to 1740, ended in a hard-won victory for the Maroons, who secured a degree of autonomy. They were granted land and allowed to govern themselves, a remarkable achievement in a time when freedom was a distant dream for so many. But peace was fragile. In 1795, tensions erupted again in the Second Maroon War. This time, the outcome was far more devastating. After months of fierce fighting, many Maroons were captured and deported, first to Nova Scotia, then to Sierra Leone. The British had reasserted their control, but the spirit of resistance lived on. Jamaica's journey to independence is a tale of resilience, resistance, and unyielding spirit. But this is just the beginning. In the next chapter, we'll dive deeper into the forces that shaped the island's path to freedom and the extraordinary individuals who led the way. This is more than just history. It's the story of a people who refused to be broken. When we think of Jamaica, we often think of reggae music, vibrant culture, and stunning beaches. But what about the story that started it all? The story of how this island came to be. Long before European explorers set their sights on Jamaica, it was home to a rich and thriving civilization, one that stretched back thousands of years. The history of Jamaica begins with the first people to settle the island, hunter-gatherers who journeyed from the Yucatan Peninsula, drawn to the fertile land and abundant resources. These early inhabitants paved the way for two waves of Taino migration from South America. The Taino were masterful navigators and farmers, and they established a network of over 200 villages, primarily along the island's southern coast. The Taino people were not just settlers, they were builders of a vibrant culture. They lived under the leadership of caciques, or chiefs, who governed their communities with a deep understanding of the land and the sea. Their villages were organized, their society structured, and their connection to the natural world was profound. For generations, the Taino thrived on the island, cultivating crops, fishing the coastal waters, and developing a culture rich in art, music, and spirituality. But their world was about to change in ways they could never have imagined. In 1494, an Italian explorer named Christopher Columbus set foot on Jamaican soil during his second voyage to the New World. Sailing under the Spanish crown, Columbus claimed the island for Spain, marking the beginning of a new and devastating chapter in the island's history. The Taino, who had lived in peace for centuries, suddenly found themselves facing an uncertain and dangerous future. At the time of Columbus's arrival, the Taino were unaware that their lives and their land were now seen as part of the vast ambitions of the Spanish Empire. The villages they had built, the fields they had cultivated, and the society they had created were all at risk of being lost forever. 
As Columbus claimed Jamaica for the crown of Castile, he set in motion events that would transform the island, leaving a legacy that still echoes today. The Taino, once rulers of their world, were thrust into a fight for survival that would reshape the history of Jamaica forever. The story of Jamaica's indigenous origins is one of resilience, adaptation, and enduring legacy. It's a story that began long before European ships arrived, but one that would soon face the profound challenges of conquest and colonization. In 1509, the Spanish Empire set its sights on a new conquest, an island rich in natural beauty but, as they would soon discover, not in the gold they craved. This island was Jamaica, and what began as an exploration quickly turned into a brutal occupation. The Spanish had arrived, and with them came a wave of change that would devastate the island's original inhabitants. Leading the charge was Juan de Esquivel, a Spanish conquistador eager to expand the empire's reach. With his men, Esquivel formally occupied Jamaica, claiming it for the crown of Castile. But the Spanish weren't here to coexist, they were here to conquer. Almost immediately, they began the systematic enslavement of the indigenous Taino people. For the Taino, life under Spanish rule was nothing short of a nightmare. Forced into labor, they were worked mercilessly on plantations and in mines. The Spanish, driven by greed and a desire to assert control, showed little regard for the lives they destroyed. Within just 50 years, the once thriving Taino population had been decimated. The island, once a land of vibrant culture and community, was left in ruins. The Spanish soon realized that their original goal of finding gold was a futile one. Jamaica, while abundant in natural resources, held little of the precious metal that had driven their conquest. Frustrated but determined to make the island profitable, the Spanish shifted their focus. Jamaica would become a crucial military outpost, supplying and supporting their larger colonizing efforts across the mainland Americas. But with the Taino population nearly wiped out, the Spanish faced a new challenge, the need for labor. The answer came in the form of the transatlantic slave trade. Ships filled with enslaved Africans began arriving on Jamaican shores, marking the beginning of a dark and tragic chapter in the island's history. The exploitation of human lives would fuel the Spanish Empire's ambitions, but at a tremendous cost. Jamaica, once home to a proud and independent people, had been transformed into a pawn in the Spanish Empire's vast colonial game. The island was no longer a place of peace and prosperity. It was a fortress, a base for military operations, and a center of human suffering. But the Spanish grip on Jamaica would not go unchallenged. As they fortified their hold on the island, new forces were beginning to stir, setting the stage for the next chapter in Jamaica's tumultuous history. The fight for control of this island was far from over. The Spanish rule in Jamaica is a tale of conquest, exploitation, and survival. The legacy of their occupation is one that still echoes today, a reminder of the heavy price of empire. But the story doesn't end here. In fact, it's just beginning. In the mid-17th century, Jamaica was about to face a dramatic change. For 146 years, the island had been under Spanish rule, but that was about to come to an abrupt end. It was May 10, 1655, during the height of the Anglo-Spanish War, when a fleet of British ships appeared on the horizon, sailing into Kingston Harbor. What happened next would alter the course of Jamaica's history forever. The British were not newcomers to conquest. They had already set their sights on the Caribbean, but after a failed attempt to seize the island of Hispaniola, they needed a victory something to salvage their reputation. That victory, they decided, would be Jamaica. On May 10, 1655, a formidable force of British sailors and soldiers stormed the shores of Kingston Harbor, ready to claim the island for the English crown. The Spanish, already weakened and spread thin across their empire, were caught off guard. On May 11th, just a day after the British arrived, Spanish forces surrendered without much of a fight. Many Spanish settlers fled to Spanish Cuba or retreated to the northern hills of the island, leaving Jamaica open to British control. It was a swift and decisive takeover that changed the fate of the island in a matter of hours. With the Spanish out of the way, the British quickly set about establishing their rule. The island's administrative center, Villa de la Vega, was promptly renamed Spanish Town, and it was here that the British established their colonial government. They set up a House of Assembly, a directly elected legislature that would oversee the island's affairs under British law. Spanish Town became the beating heart of British Jamaica, a place where decisions were made, laws were passed, and the future of the island was shaped. The British saw Jamaica as more than just a trophy of war. It was an opportunity. The island's fertile land and strategic location in the Caribbean made it a prime asset for the British Empire. They envisioned a prosperous colony, one that would fuel their ambitions and expand their influence in the region. But to achieve that, they needed to secure their control and make Jamaica their own. The British wasted no time in transforming Jamaica into a lucrative colony. They established plantations, 
introduced the transatlantic slave trade on a massive scale and began exporting sugar, rum, and other goods back to England. But as the island's economy grew, so did the tensions between the colonizers and those they sought to control. The British may have claimed Jamaica, but their hold on the island was anything but secure. The British takeover was only the beginning. What followed was a period of intense exploitation, conflict, and resistance that would shape Jamaica's identity for centuries to come. As the island's new rulers tightened their grip, they had no idea of the challenges that lay ahead. The struggle for control of Jamaica was far from over. Jamaica's transformation into a British colony set the stage for new alliances, rebellions, and a fight for freedom that would span generations. The story of British Jamaica is one of power, resistance, and an unyielding desire for autonomy. What started with a single invasion would lead to centuries of conflict and change as the people of Jamaica fought to reclaim their land and their identity. But that's a story for another time. For now, we've only scratched the surface of Jamaica's journey from Spanish possession to British colony. Jamaica's landscape is as diverse as its history. Mountains, forests, and rugged terrain that have seen more than their fair share of conflict. But these natural fortresses were more than just scenery. They became the stronghold of a powerful force that would challenge the very foundations of colonial rule, the Jamaican Maroons. During the Anglo-Spanish War, chaos and conflict presented a rare opportunity for the enslaved. As Spanish colonizers struggled to hold on to Jamaica, many of the enslaved seized their chance for freedom, fleeing into the island's dense mountains and forests. There, they found refuge among the surviving Tainos, forming a new society that would become known as the Jamaican and Maroons. The Maroons were more than just escaped slaves. They were survivors, warriors, and the embodiment of resistance. As they settled in the remote regions of Jamaica, like the impenetrable cockpit country, they built communities that were fiercely independent and determined to remain free. Over time, these communities grew, strengthened by the addition of more escapees and through the blending of cultures. The Maroons became a symbol of defiance, and their presence was a constant thorn in the side of the British colonial powers. Life in Maroon territory was harsh, but it was free. The Maroons thrived in the mountainous interior, where their knowledge of the land gave them a tactical advantage against colonial forces. They were skilled in guerrilla warfare, striking fear into the hearts of plantation owners with their daring raids and their ability to disappear into the wilderness. For 76 years, the Maroons clashed with the British, engaging in skirmishes that would lay the groundwork for the island's long tradition of resistance. But the Maroons weren't just fighting for themselves, they were fighting for something bigger. Their acts of rebellion inspired enslaved Africans across the island to rise up against their oppressors. Every escape to Maroon territory, every raid on a plantation, and every skirmish with British troops was a statement. Jamaica would not be easily conquered. The Maroons' influence extended far beyond their hidden villages. They became a beacon of hope for the enslaved, a living testament to the possibility of freedom. As more African slaves escaped to join the Maroons, the British faced a growing problem. An internal resistance that they could neither defeat nor control. The Maroons' relentless defiance planted the seeds of a broader movement, one that would eventually grow into a full-blown struggle for independence. But this was only the beginning. The spirit of rebellion that the Maroons embodied would continue to burn, fueling the fight for a Jamaica free from colonial rule. The Maroon Wars marked a turning point in Jamaica's history. They were the first true challenge to British dominance, a powerful reminder that the fight for freedom was far from over. The echoes of their battles would resonate through the generations, as Jamaica's people continued to resist, rebel, and rise up against oppression. The story of the Maroons is a story of courage, resilience, and the unbreakable will to be free. It's a story that doesn't end with the British conquest. It's one that continues, a vital chapter in the larger narrative of Jamaica's path to independence. By the early 18th century, tensions between the British colonizers and the Jamaican Maroons had reached a boiling point. The Maroons, descendants of escaped African slaves and indigenous Tainos, had established independent communities deep within the island's rugged terrain for the British. These communities represented a significant threat, one they were determined to crush. But the Maroons had no intention of surrendering their hard-won freedom. In 1728, this simmering tension erupted into open conflict, marking the beginning of the First Maroon War. The British, armed with superior weapons and the confidence of an empire, believed they could easily subdue the Maroons. But they underestimated the resilience and cunning of their opponents. The Maroons knew every inch of cockpit country, a dense, maze-like forest that was nearly impossible to navigate for those unfamiliar with its treacherous paths. Time and again, British troops attempted to penetrate Maroon territory, only to be repelled by hit-and-run tactics and the natural defenses of the land. The Maroons, led by their skilled leaders, fought with an intensity born of the desire to protect their freedom. After years of failed campaigns, the British were forced to accept that they could not win this war by force alone. Recognizing that a military victory was out of reach, the British turned to negotiation. In 1739, 
the First Maroon War came to an end with a treaty that granted the Maroons semi-autonomy within their five towns. While the Maroons were required to live under the oversight of a British supervisor, they retained the right to govern themselves according to their own customs and laws. It was a rare concession from the British, who had to acknowledge the strength and determination of their adversaries. But peace, as it often does, proved fleeting. In 1795, tensions between the British and the Maroons of Kudjo's town, also known as Trelawney Town, flared up once more. This time, the conflict escalated into what would become known as the Second Maroon War, a brutal and bloody confrontation that would test both sides to their limits. The Second Maroon War was fought with a ferocity that left deep scars on the island. For five months, a bloody stalemate gripped Jamaica as both sides inflicted heavy losses. The Maroons launched attacks on plantations, fighting to defend their home, killing owners, and freeing slaves. The British, determined to end the conflict, responded with overwhelming force. Major General George Walpole, leading the British efforts, devised a strategy to trap the Maroons within their own territory. Armed posts and bloodhounds were deployed to surround Trelawney Town, slowly tightening the noose around the Maroons. By early January 1796, the Maroons, faced with the very real threat of annihilation, were forced to enter negotiations. Open discussions began in March, but the British had already decided the fate of their opponents. Under the guise of peace talks, the British used the delay to prepare for the deportation of the majority of the Trelawney Maroons. First, they were sent to the harsh climate of Nova Scotia, and later, those who survived were relocated to Sierra Leone in West Africa. The outcome of the Second Maroon War was a bitter one for the Maroons. Their autonomy was shattered, and their community dispersed across the globe. But their legacy of resistance would live on, fueling the flames of Jamaican nationalism for generations to come. The Maroon Wars were more than just battles. They were symbols of the unyielding fight for freedom that has defined Jamaica's history. Though the Maroons faced devastating losses, their courage and resilience laid the groundwork for the island's ongoing struggle for self-determination. By the early 20th century, Jamaica was a land caught between the remnants of its colonial past and the uncertain promise of its future. Slavery had been abolished in 1834, and over time, the native and African populations had gained certain rights, including the right to vote. Yet, despite these hard-won victories, the real power still rested in the hands of the white colonial elite. It was against this backdrop of inequality and struggle that one man would rise to become a beacon of hope for black people, not just in Jamaica but across the globe, Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey wasn't just a leader, he was a visionary, a man who dared to dream of a world where black people could stand tall and proud, free from the shadows of oppression. Born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica, in 1887, Garvey witnessed firsthand the struggles of his people. From an early age, he understood that the fight for equality would require more than just words, it would demand action. Garvey's journey as a leader began in the labor movement, where he quickly made a name for himself as an advocate for workers' rights. But his vision extended far beyond the borders of Jamaica. Garvey believed that true liberation for black people could only be achieved through unity, unity that transcended nations, cultures, and continents. This belief led him to create one of the most influential movements of the 20th century, the Back to Africa movement. The Back to Africa movement was bold, ambitious, and, to some, radical. Garvey called on people of African descent to return to the lands of their ancestors, where they could build a future free from the oppression and racism that had plagued them for centuries. His message resonated deeply with millions, especially those who had experienced the harsh realities of colonialism and segregation. Garvey's vision wasn't just about geography, it was about reclaiming identity, dignity, and pride. But Garvey's aspirations didn't stop there. He founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNEA, in 1914, a movement dedicated to promoting civil rights, economic independence, and the cultural upliftment of black people. The UNIA quickly grew into a global organization with branches in the United States, the Caribbean, and beyond. At its peak, it boasted over a million members, all united under Garvey's banner of one God, one aim, one destiny. Jamaica's journey to independence. We have come to the end of part one. Join us for part two of this journey for the rest of Marcus Garvey, Alexander Bustamante, and Michael Manley era on the road to independence. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to leave a like, share, comment, or subscribe for more like this. See you in the next one.